Okay. And also someone asked that um, students speak up. So when you talk, make sure you're not talking to me, you're talking to everyone. Okay, so please do that. Okay, so you're going to talk about evidence. So we've been talking about history of life, right? Then we'll be talking about various processes we know about life. How do we know all this stuff? Okay. So, this so intrigue is a snake and there's a dinosaur. What's happening there? Okay. So, learning objectives for today. I want you to think like a macroevolutionary biologist to sort of reconstruct the community. I also want you to learn how biologists gather evidence from macroevolutionary processes. Um, so, break up the groups of three, and then I've made fossils, fossils for each of you. Um, mm -hmm. Those in the back, and two of them. Don't eat them. <laughs> I believe there's no poison ivy, but don't lick your fingers either. Okay. So, we're going to talk about what your fossils tell you about where they were found. Okay, what lives there? What's the climate like there? What species live there, not just the plants? Okay. So, go. Go to. And I mean, groups of approximately three, you can do pairs too. Oh yeah, learning each other's learn names too. It's a good idea. Yeah. 
All right, three more minutes. One minute. Dig deep. Learn all you can. Okay. So good. So what you can do is then, you know, tell, tell, tell the class what you learned. And like other people in the class, try to tear it down. Right? So, in the way, this is the way science works, right? I have an idea, and someone else says, no! And you go to the data and argue about it, right? Until we, until we find the truth, or get better and better approximations of the truth, right? So if I say, oh yeah, there must be giraffes there, you can say, oh, sure, that makes sense. You're like, no, you have to prove it. Right? You see tongue marks of giraffes. Or whatever. Okay, so who wants to start? So, we've got um, <laughs> some evidence of the No. Are insects the only small herbivores? No. What else? What else could it be? Right. Could also be like millipedes. Could be snails. How, how do you know it's herbivory? No one's attacking that? Usually broader leaves are Okay, good. <laughs> no, but this, 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 this is good. This is, this is what science does. That's good. One, one more from that group. Shallow root structure. Okay. Besides that, good. All right, another group. Thanks. Yeah. So, what would lead you to think it's pollinators rather than wind pollination? Yeah, that's, I mean, it's good to put out a hypothesis. Can you think of an exception to that? You're right. I mean, showy flowers do indicate some sort of animal pollination. Can you think of any exceptions to that? Yeah. 
this and it's a bit it's a bit like lighter yellow color. And uh we went to the barn where they kind of kept it in place and the arm uh And so we see, I mean, in life there's something. So, like, showy flowers generally correlate with po with animal pollination, but if you have something later evolved wind pollination, it might take a while for the showy flowers to catch up, right? So you can still have a white showy flower, but you're wind pollinated, and there's some selection pressure against having expensive petals, but not a huge pressure, and so it takes a while for that to evolve away. Good. Okay. Other 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 observations. It's good. Okay. So what does it say about the environment where they, where they live? Mm -hmm. And a place where there's enough wind to disperse and pollen. Yep. A open field. Yep. Okay, what else? Criticize that? They're all lousy scientists. That's the joy of science, criticizing others. Good. What else? It's like a lot of these are pretty healthy, so like not in terms of the river, but I mean like the natural things like that. Those people think. Any criticisms of that? I got a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you resolve your disagreement? <laughs> Just as it dawn. Mm -hmm. How do you, that's good, but let's go back to the how, how do you decide, you know, is this a sort of thriving environment or is one that's decaying? And how, how would you resolve that, that dis disagreement? Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Right, so one way you could have an unhealthy environment is if you have a monoculture or something like that, right? Um, How would you tell whether these plants are sort of healthier than you expect or you know decaying more than you expect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you look at the proportion of say dead or dying leaves and then compare it to contemporary estimates. Right, so in, in forests that are drought stressed, what's the proportion? In forests that are doing well, what's the proportion? In forests that have, um, you know, fungus moving through, what's the proportion? And so you can compare this proportion to that if you want to be doing it. Okay. So you mentioned they're fungi. Okay. Why is that important? They have the ecological roles. What else can you, can you infer? Why? Okay. 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 You can be asexual and have seeds, but, but like dandelions. But yeah. Of course, they could still butt off too, yeah. but, but at least that you know that there's some seed dispersal. Yeah. What else do we know? Right. 
even though they don't have big fossilized trunks, we know that all oaks are woody and become trees, and so there must be oak trees around. Or oak trees uphill that roll their acorns down the hill, or upstream that roll their acorns down the stream. Right? I mean, and actually what I did is a little nasty to you guys. This is actually a mixture of two different sites, which is what happens with fossils too. You get some, some you know, you have stuff here that died here, plus stuff washed in. Not really hard. But they're both not, both not the skulls. Okay, anything else? Okay, excellent. So you see how you can make all these inferences about like, they're pollinators, it's a forest, it's temperate. Um, there's not great droughts because there's shallow, shallow roots. I mean, all this information about this environment, you infer it from just, you know, a handful of specimens on paper towel. Okay? And that's sort of how you deal with macroevolution and paleontology. Right? So we have little bits of information about the world, and from them we can make inferences and test them. And we can argue about them and then go back to the data and say, oh, well, actually, no, you're wrong because of X. Okay? And keep finding our ideas that way. <coughs> right? so remember to wash your hands. Good advice in general, but. Um, so. Here are various kinds of evidence we have for macroevolutionary studies. Okay. Molecular fossils, trace fossils, body fossils, phylogenetics, exit organisms, and direct experiments. Okay. So here we have some 3.5 billion year old um, rock. I say, were things living there or not? And it's been, you don't see like little, you know, little dinosaurs, of course, different frankly, that would be pretty cool. But you don't see any little cells or any sort of molecular fossils like that, okay? What we do have is distribution of um, carbon chain lengths in the fossil. What do you see about these lengths? Bell shaped? Yep. Yep, a lot of white lids. What else? Is there any frequency for some drops? What is it? Yep. Right, people can see, and so once you get here, we go high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low. Right? And this is taken as evidence that there was life there, because life tends to um, create. <coughs> um, uh, prefer uh, preference to create uh, carbon chains that are odd numbers. Okay, so whereas natural processes create an even distribution of even and odds. Okay, more smooth bell curve. So the fact that we have a bell curve just makes sense. But then the fact that we have, you know, these odd peaks suggests that these are synthesized by life rather than by any sort of other, you know, abiotic processes. Because even though you can't see any fossils, this chemical composition tells you something. Here's another thing we're looking at, um, oxygen isotope ratios and um, carbon ratios through time to measure things like um, amount of oxygen and, and metabolism that's happening in place in time. Okay. So again, we can use this, you know, this chemical evidence, how much of this do I have versus this versus this, right, to figure out what was happening with life at that point. And so, for example, here, these data are used to show that archaea would be, were, were important in this ecosystem. Even though we have archaea fossils, when we come to composition, we think there's archaea there. Okay. Any questions about Yeah. Um, Okay. 
Okay, and famously we use a sort of evidence for looking at uh, climate change through time, right? So we know recently it was getting warmer, so 1990, 1970, right? We can also do further back in time, right? And then further back in time, further back in time, using different data, using different data, overlapping data sets to estimate, you know, how climate has changed through time. And so you can zoom out and get more and more, you know, more and more greater overview of this. Okay, there's another kind of fossil. Okay, so there's more molecular fossils. Here is some other kind of fossils. So what do you see here? Probably hard to see anything, right? So here, that's a worm burrow. Okay. And here is a trilobite burrow. Okay. And these are in funnels, these are in the mud. Okay. And what people think is that this indicates that a worm burrow here and a trilobite came and called out trying to hunt the worm. Going down after the tunnel, reaching through with its claws legs try to grab it. Okay. So evidence of you know, ancient predation event and hunting, without even finding any of the body, any body fossils, just finding the tracks they've left. Okay. Okay. Here's another example of a trace fossil. Right? So dinosaur footprints. So how do you know dinosaurs move to some dinosaurs like sauropods moves in herds? Well, we find evidence of trackways where they're moving in parallel, okay, and they have small footprints in the middle. Okay? So this also indicates that they must have been protecting them against predators. Right? So they have large dinosaurs on the outside and more you know, vulnerable ones on the inside. Okay? So we have evidence of this behavior. We have evidence of how fast they walk from the scribe lane. Just from fossil tracks, even without finding the organ itself. Okay. So this is, these look like your fossils, right? But they're tens of millions of years old. So these are fossils showing leaf damage. Okay. So typically, paleontologists would only, you know, if you go to a place that has lots of fossils, they take the one that are the best ones home. The ones that aren't broken, dumps, spotted, and stuff like that. But what these researchers have done is <coughs> taken a, a, a good sample of fossils home. So rather than take preference to taking the best, they take all the fossils and look for damage. Okay. And you see feeding damage. You see here um, a leaf miner. Right? So there are some insects that live between the top surface and bottom surface of the leaf. You can see as they grow, their tunnel gets bigger, as wider as they get bigger. You can see these you know, little swirlies and leaves. Um, <coughs> so you can see all this evidence of damage. Okay. And so, at this thermal maximum, 55.8 million years ago, um, <coughs> they find what happens when you have temperature increase. What happens on the river? And they find this also more damage. Okay? So as so as temperatures warm, plants are hit more by insects. Okay, it's interesting. So something now we know climate change is happening now. We can predict will insects you know become will insect damage become more common because insects do better at higher temperatures or less common because plants have more carbon dioxide and can devote more energy to secondary compounds that taste bad for insects. At least in the Eocene, there was more damage with, with higher temperature. Okay, so also gives us another way of looking at inf inferring paleo temperatures. So now we know this correlation between d feeding damage and temperature. If we have a period of time where we don't know what the temperature was, but we have an implication of feeding damage. We can interpolate and get an estimate of what the, what the temperature was. Okay. Okay. Here's another kind of fossil. Okay, this is a coprolite. Okay. Anyone know what that what that is? Exactly. Okay. 
And so you can see what the animal is eating. Okay? And so <coughs> um, grasses, you know, grasses like we have here, right? If you rub them, they're sort of rough, right? And inside they have silica, okay, little bits of glass. Why do horses have such big teeth? It's to grind down all this sandpaper they're eating all the time. Right? Um, <coughs> and some animals I mean, actually die as elephants. They'll eventually wear out their molars and then die. Like it's, it's eating this hard, hard stuff. But you can find these phytoliths inside coprolites. And so since they're characteristic of different groups of grasses, you can say, oh, I found this phytolith in this coprolite. That means that this animal was eating this group of grasses at the time period it was found. Okay, so again, way of figuring out ancestral, like ancient behavior and diet, right, from you know, tens of millions of years ago. Okay. Who knows what an extra floral nectary is? What is it? Mm-hmm. So nectar is like you know flowers make nectar fine, but once you have something, you can use it somewhere else, right? So by having it just in the flower, you can stick it on a leaf, right? And what does that do? Well, then ants will go and get that. So the ants are sort of bribed by the salt water, by the sugar water. Right? In return, it's thought they protect the plant against paper and things like that. Um, when that first, when did that behavior evolve? Well, the final leaves evolved in the leaf scene. They have fossils that have full nectars. Okay, so. It suggests that there are ants at this point that are having this defensive behavior. So then we get really good details from body fossils too. Okay. Um, here you can see this animal is bilaterally organized. You can see something about actually the that structure on this fossil. Okay. It's not just sort of a cast to the outside. It's in detail of the inside of the animal in its oscillation. Okay. Here's another example of fossilized behavior. Okay. So here is a dinosaur nest okay, with eggs and then some animal hatching and a snake in the same nest. And so someone would be excited about some new model, right? Um, you know, this thing. And so <coughs> it potentially, you know, ancestral behavior fossilized of so good dinosaur and then warm sandstorm, everyone dies. Fossilized. Okay? You should be skeptical. Why? It's good to do be anyway, but Oh, the snake's on top of the eggs, so no. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, anyone famous? Make, who's, heard of, who's heard of Oviraptor? Yeah. What does Oviraptor mean? Right, egg thief. And it was found on top of a nest of eggs. And now I think actually it was on top of its own eggs. And so they thought originally it was like, you know, this, this old raptor sort of like, imagine a ostrich <laughs> with claws. And like, um, we thought, okay, this thing is, you know, they're eating the eggs, but actually now it's been about eight eggs. Right. And so it could be that, you know, the, not that the snake is guarding the dinosaur eggs. Right? Like, sorry. It could have been passing through, right? And so they consume the, the, the dinosaur eggs. <coughs> okay. So again, there's evidence. So what, how would you just how would you decide whether there was predation by, on dinosaurs by snakes or not? Would you then what would you then do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they, they know it's, it was a dinosaur. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what, what would you do? So, you know, you find this and your advisor says, oh, that's great, but prove it for the science paper. Could they find it? No, that's okay. Yeah. Could they find it 
possibly. Yeah, but just take a look to see if the snakes are consuming dinosaurs. They probably don't. You probably won't get that detail though. If it was more recent than you could. Yeah. Did they date? Right, could have died, you know, ten years later, which you can't get resolved or yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. And we're, and we're going to talk about these sort of biases now on Friday. So it's good. To think about it. Um, but how could you, you know, what what could you do to show that actually yes, snakes are eating dinosaurs? What would be your research program to show that? Mm-hmm. Yep. So you go basically go find more data, right? And so you have, from this from this you have a prediction: snakes ate dinosaurs. And now you can go and say, okay, if snakes ate dinosaurs, then I should be able to find some snake fossils that have dinosaur bones inside them. I should be able to find some snake coprolites that have little dinosaur pieces inside them. Um, actually, I'm not sure. Do snakes digest all even the bones? Yeah. Okay. So that wouldn't work. Um, okay, but you can, you can go and go get new evidence. You make a prediction about the past, and then go test it by going to find more data about the past. Okay, so it's a, it's a predictive science, even though you're just finding old dead stuff. Okay, but you can still decide where to go look for more things. Okay, what? Uh -huh. <laughs> Were there any bones there? Okay. Okay. You can also look for evidence of adaptations. So snakes that eat eggs sometimes have sharpened bones inside to sort of crush the shell or pierce the shell. And so you can think, does this snake you know, have those that's consistent with egg eating? And is it a big enough size that the only eggs it could have eaten were dinosaur eggs? There's evidence of that, 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 that kind too. So here's a T-Rex skull. Here's all the different things you can figure out from skulls like this. So for example, you could do a model of it and figure out what stress is being put on it by biting. Okay. So we know how bone moves and flexes. Right? And like my arm bone reports so much weight and then it will snap. Right? So like they know I can't, you know, make a living breaking open, you know, geos and looking for grubs or something. But they just don't have the strength to yeah. move it first. So you know, grubs inside geo. <laughs> um, so you can look at the stress of the T-Rex skull and say, okay, could it just bite off bits of dead stuff, or could it grab a hadrosaur that's wrestling and, and rip off sharp? You know? And so you can see, would it, would it break? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> Right, so dinosaur bones are probably most similar to bird bones in terms of structure, right? Especially, you know, theropods like this. So you can use bird bones as an analog, but of course bird bones have been evolving through time too. So you can say, okay, dinosaurs are the nearest modern relatives to dinosaurs are birds, right? Bird dinosaurs aren't birds. But also over here we have crocs. So you can say, okay. It might be like among birds, but birds have also had almost Evolutionary time, so it crocs. Okay, we can try using both kinds of them. Okay. Let's find evidence for what they ate from other fossils. So here's a hexor tailbone that has some teeth from this in it. Okay, so teeth got in there somehow. Okay, that's the way it's eating those. Okay. Um, <coughs> you know, where patterns in the bones? Um, <coughs> but the kind of the shape of the teeth. Now, the sheep teeth good for, you know, catching fish. You know, so narrow and pointy. Are they good for cutting flesh? Are they good for gripping and holding? Okay, so you can test those things. Okay, so lots of all the information about behavior from, you know, a skull. Yeah. <laughs> 
Another source of evidence from the past is phylo phylogenase. Okay? And so <coughs> here's the phylogeny of bird flu. We'll talk more about what phylogenies mean in a few, in a few weeks. Um, but basically, it's a you know, bird history. Okay? And so we can figure out, um, map on where, the, where these flus were found figure out where they essentially arose. Okay. You can also look at the sequence and find out what change in the sequence would make it very infectious. Okay, so that way in the future we can look and say, you know, oh, we see a flu evolving this way, watch out, it could go and sweep through the world again. Okay, so we can figure out evolutionary processes from that. These are my favorite examples. So, this is a Pandara frog. And that's its call. And so these sort of show its calls of different species. Shift. Okay. And what they did was measure extant ones. And then using that particular history, reconstruct what they answered in their sound play. Okay. And so it's sort of like an average of different species. It's not quite that, it's more complex than that, but it's pretty good. It's typically an average. So we need to figure out what the stuff could have been like. And then they do playback experiments. Okay? So here's a female. And then they have one speaker playing one song, and one speaker playing another song. And they can play songs from the same species. They can play songs from other extant species. Or since they can reconstruct the ancestral calls, they can play songs from those. Okay, and see how she responds to those. And so, here's a, here's the, here's the, here's the frog. Okay. How do you respond to your sister species? Okay. You know, he is point zero zero one. Okay. So she recognizes her sister species and did not make it at all. It's not very good. Okay. It's a very good, good certain species. Okay. But there's an ancestral sequence. She responded to her own species, but also according to this ancestral sequence pretty well, too. And even way back here, essentially distinguishing her species from this long dead of ancestor. Okay. Even though, you know, she's your, she, you know, she has all this history of this species. So you don't push related to this one than she is to this one. Okay. She has all this shared history. And yet she she will talk, she try to get with this one. It's just character displacement. After the selection pressure for not many the wrong species, you could evolve away and sound different from each other. Okay. It suggests that they would evolve in this way based on this tree, during the data, and the structure. Okay, so the way of testing is, is there this character displacement using all these data sources. <coughs> Another thing you do is estimate speciation extinction rates. Okay. So here's a study showing speciation rate and extinction rate versus latitude. Okay. Why is this interesting? Why, why bother doing this? Why to get into science? What's the pattern they're trying to explain? <laughs> Right. So this latitudinal gradient in diversity, right? So the tropics is tons of species. As you go further away from the tropics, north or south, you get fewer and fewer species. Why is that? So it could be that in the tropics, there's a lot more speciation and the same amount of extinction. Or it could be the same amount of speciation and less extinction. And it could be a mixture of the two. And so this study is trying to, attempting to do that. And they found, actually, that both speciation and extinction increase in the gradient. And if you look at the net rates, <laughs> so you the net rates um, of speciation minus extinction, pretty linear. So, okay. so this is suggesting that the reason for more, more diversity in the tropics is not due to higher diversification in the tropics. There must be some other reason. Okay. And so this study really answers that question.
We also have evidence about macroevolution from recent stuff, from stuff that's evolving very recently. Okay, so this is a sort of classic example now of sticklebacks. Okay, and the story is as <coughs> sea levels dropped, certain lakes got isolated populations of marine species. Okay, and they evolved to eat plankton in the lake, and then sea levels rose again, and then fell again, and they got another introduction of sticklebacks, and there's potentially competition. And what it seems like in some cases, and not all lakes do this, you know, only a few lakes actually, you get this divergence and you have one, one morph living high up in the water column eating plankton, and one morph living down the bottom. Okay? It's a very classic example of character displacement and sort of potential allopatric speciation, though not quite allopatric, uh, not, so potential sympatric speciation, but not quite, happening repeatedly in these lakes. We have these repeated evolutionary instances and see if it, you know, what processes led to them. And finally, we can do direct experiments in the lab. Okay? So, who's heard of, of species doing things for the good of the species? Who believes it? Okay. So I see hesitation. So, so why, do, why do you believe it? Okay, so social insects are actually interesting. So what they're actually doing is maximizing um, their gene genes being carried on to the next generation by helping this one individual, their queen, survive. So actually, is still individual level selection, I think, rather than good at the species level selection. We're going to come back to that, but that's something that's been you know an active debate in biology for a long time. Yep, and so so, so I mean, people used to think that. You know, if you watch any of the old documentary, for the good of the species, they have to compete, and only the best male will pass on his genes. Or so there's actually a theory that frogs called in order to do a census and say, you know, how many are we? How many are we? Up? Oh, okay, we're too many. I won't breed this year. You guys go ahead. Um, right? <coughs> yeah. Oh, lemmings. We'll cover that later. Actually. The it's actually, a, it's actually it's, it was, Disney used to make these classic nature documentaries, and for that one they had a turntable spinning, and they put lemons in the turntable, and then filmed them. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, yeah. But we'll, we'll come to that, that's good. Yeah, so, but that would be a, be an example of, like, you know, let me kill myself, so, the, yeah, I mean, that would be that would be an example, but it's actually a fake example. It's good. But it's good to think of exceptions like that. Um, but there might be cases where you do do things that are both for the that help both the group and yourself, right? If that also helps your own genes, and so to to resolve this, people have actually done experiments on you know, groups of tribillion beetles <coughs> in human populations, and then try different mixings, different selection on the populations, and see if you select for a group characteristic, can the individuals respond to that? Okay, so sort of looking at group selection versus individual selection. Okay, and so you can develop theoretical models for this. Also, you can just do it in the lab. And this is where you guys could do it over the semester if you wanted to, publish a paper. Okay. And so there are all these different kinds of ways of figuring out information about evolution, going from molecular fossils all the way down to manipulative experiments. Okay. So think of some macroevolutionary questions you've heard about. What would be the best source of evidence to resolve them? So I'll let you break into groups for a couple minutes quickly, and we can talk about it as a, as a class.
<laughs> All right. So let's come together. So what do, what do groups come up with? So I'm using phylogenetics, so and using molecular data to reconstruct the tree. It's not like molecular fossils; it's not looking at chemicals in the rocks. It's looking at extant organisms and reconstructing. Yep. Good. What else? Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, modeling that, I mean, so there's a professor in this department, Sergei Gavrilets, who just worked on a model of evolution of homosexuality. So it was epigenetics, yeah. And the model is good for that, but then you should also go and verify with real data, so like measure other epigenetic factors and that sort of thing. Yeah. Good. What else? I'm paid to wait. You guys are paying me. So. <laughs> I'm not going to go talking. We have a question of whether something one species or two species. What sort of data we could use for that? Mm -hmm. Yep, so you do the experiment, see if they'll mate in the lab, that sort of thing. Yeah, and then you can do phylogenetics too, but we'll get to that later. All right, good. All right, I'll see you on Friday. Talk about tar pits. <laughs> and don't forget your clickers. <laughs>